and Publication, organized by Department of Commerce School of Business Management and Legal Studies, University of Kerala. Let's resume our conference and I welcome you all to the track two. In this section, we have two chairs. We are glad enough to, the, to welcome the chairs of the tra track, Dr. Rasia Begum and Dr. Bijuti. Firstly, we welcome Professor Dr. Rasia Begum, Department of Commerce, University of Kerala, and serve as the Dean Faculty of Commerce. She was awarded PhD in Commerce from University of Kerala. She has 30 years of teaching experience at a postgraduate level and has graded 16 research scholars who were awarded PhDs and 80 MPhil scholars. Moreover, she has co-authored three books and published 67 articles. Being a woman with extraordinary talents, she coordinates various education council and committees. I invite Mr. Abhijit P.S. and Dr. Anthony Joseph of Secondly, we welcome Dr. Vijuti, Associate Professor, Department of Commerce, University of Kerala. He has is an excellent motivator, mentor, and a great teacher. He, would, he worked as the district coordinator of Kerala State Poverty Eradication Mission for Industry for three years under the local self department government of Kerala and emerged as the best district mission coordinator. He also worked as the research officer in the Kerala State Higher Education Council. He has published 40 research papers in various journals and edited books. I'm taking this opportunity to invite such an inspiring personality to chair the session. Welcome you both. Chair the session. Over to you. So most welcome, Professor Hi. Rashid Bikram, uh, Faculty Dean, uh, uh, Faculty of Commerce, and Dr. Biju Terence, uh, Associate Professor, Department of Commerce, to the session. I thank the rapporteur for the nice words. Respected Conference Secretary, uh, Professor G. Raju, Respected Organizing Secretary, Dr. Viju A.V., and the entire team of organizers, including research scholar, uh, scholars and students who are rendering valuable services for the smooth conduct of this international conference today. And my uh, fellow chair, Dr. Biju T, who is my learned colleague at the department, all the delegates, and the chairpersons of previous sessions, uh, Professor Hemal Pandya, Dr. Kinneri Thakur, Professor Simon Tuttle, uh, Professor P. N. Harikuma, and uh, the paper presenters of this track C. Uh, good evening, all of you. Being in the third track of the same day, same day, I don't think there is any need of, uh, I, I mean, explaining the procedure, like what is the necessity for uh, keeping time and everything as you have seen in the previous session if you if the daily if the paper presenter spent time on uh, reading the text matter you will be losing time you will not be able to uh, present the important part of your paper anyway uh, i understand that so many papers were received for the conference and the organizers have carefully shortlisted uh, 30 papers for presentation in three tracks in the third track, we have, I understand that there are uh, 10 purpose. We are given the list of 10 purpose and authors of 10 purpose. We'll be uh, taking one by one. Myself and my co-chair, Dr. Biju, uh, will be, dealing with, be taking our alternatively. Dr. Biju will also share his views after each presentation. Uh, since it is almost uh, 3.40, I'm not spending much time. So... Special congratulations to the uh, delegates whose papers were selected for presentation in uh, in this track. So, wish you all the best. Uh, Dr. Biju, do you want to share something in this stage or you'll join after presentation of each paper? Richard, uh, we can start now because of city of time. Uh, we'll do the presentation now. After that, uh, we'll Okay, so with that note, we will uh, deal with the, we'll go to the first presentation. The title is, I, 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 will, uh, I, I prefer to remind you that the, you need not spend much time on the theory part of your paper. 
Uh, because the title itself would be conveying in most of the cases. If it is very, very new, like that, there is one paper, one particular paper in that, in, in this session. Anyway, so it takes more, very little time for explaining the team straight away, go to, after a brief introduction, go to the objectives, methodology, and findings. So first paper is challenges and prospects for economic growth in India. Uh, it is a joint paper by Mr. Samar Salame and Dr. Sanabeth. Uh, they are from the School of Management and Business Studies, Jamia Hamdat, New Delhi. I hope they are. Uh, hello, sir. Hello, sir. Anma. Yeah, what is the Yeah, okay, one second. Okay, sir, is the screen uh, visible? Yeah, visible, visible. Yeah. Yes, yes, okay. you may go ahead. Okay, so, uh, thank you, sir, and uh, ma'am for giving us uh, this uh, opportunity. Uh, I'm Samir Salama, research scholar, uh, School of Management and Business Study, Jamia Ahmedat, New Delhi. I will present uh, uh, the paper challenges and the prospect for uh, economic growth uh, in India. I prepared this paper with Dr. Uh, Sanabek. Uh, uh, India is considering one of uh, the largest economies in the world and has created an economy with a growth rate about 7% as average during the period uh, 2010 to 2019. Uh, and uh, uh, India is the third largest economy after China and United States uh, and uh, has one of highest de uh, developing uh, service sector in the world with 50% of value added. Uh, in the other side, poverty, income inequality, unemployment, structure imbalances, all considering key challenges to maintain sustainable uh, high growth rate. And there's a large number of studies have studied the relationship between economic growth and microeconomic factors like inflation, unemployment generation, industrial and agriculture development, which have uh, many effects of the economic uh, it was, therefore, we uh, will analyze uh, uh, the main fact, uh, main microeconomic factor, uh, uh, which have uh, many uh, effects on the economic growth. The objective of, of study review of Indian economic growth prospects analyzes the main structure and balances which facing the Indian economy. It supports the constraints on sustainable and rapid growth. The methodology the study based mainly on the secondary data. Uh, the, uh, uh, during the period 2010 till 2019, the source of data mainly from the World Bank of India, World Bank, and IMF. Uh, first, uh, I will start with the cross prospect for Indian economy. Uh, IMF uh, say that the Indian economy is expected to continue grow, uh, growing during the period 2021 to uh, 2024, and it will reach to 7.7. .7 uh, growth rate in 2024 uh, as uh, shown in the figure. And uh, by the study, by the study, uh, uh, future of India, uh, uh, Price uh, Waterhouse uh, Cops, uh, uh, the study uh, uh, say that India need to achieve 9% uh, GDP growth rate uh, to available to create between 10 to 11 million jobs uh, every uh, year to improve the quality of life of for more than 1.2 billion people to solve economic and social uh, problems to increasing life expectancy from uh, 60 years to 80 years to improve productivity in agriculture from 4 tons, uh, ton by hectare to 7.4 tons by hectare to increasing value added in manufacturing from 12% of GDP to 25%. And according to many studies and forecasts, the Indian economy will be among the largest and most important three economies in the world, as uh, shown by uh, the table. So India among the top five world power by 2050. And uh, if we see the last uh, uh, prospect, so India, uh, it will be the second largest economy in the world and it will exceed the United States. Construction on sustainable and rapid growth in India. 
Uh, at the first, uh, I, I analyzed the cross, the cross rate by sector, uh, as shown in the figure. We see uh, the main results, the general trend of sectoral growth during the period 2010-2019 was characterized by declining growth in the sector of agriculture, industry, and, and manufacturing against increasing growth in the surface sector. We see in the year 2010, the uh, highest growth rate was in the agriculture sector, and, uh, and after that, there's decreasing uh, in the manufacturer, industry, and uh, agriculture. And in the year 2019, uh, there's slow growth in agriculture and high growth in service sector. And uh, we can see uh, the, the growth rate uh, in the industry and manufacturing around 0 0.01 at the, uh, the World Bank data. Uh, second, by analyzing the main changes in our uh, output sector uh, during the same period, the main result, the share of industry in GDP decreased from 31% uh, in 2010 to 24% uh, in 2019, and the share of manufacturing it remains stagnant, about 15% as average during the same period. The largest decrease was in the share of agriculture from 27% from GDP in 1990 to 17% in 2010 to 16% in 2019. The share of service increased, uh, increased significantly from 37% in 1990 and continued to increase until reached 49% uh, in 2019. Uh, third, uh, I uh, analyzed the structure shift in the work uh, force in India during the same period. As the figure we can see, the agriculture uh, uh, sector employed the bulk of labor forests, around 46% of la labor forests as average during the period 2010-19, uh, while its share of GDP only 16% in 2019. Service sector employed only 30% of labor forests as average, uh, but, uh, while its share of GDP around 50%. The share of labor forests employed in industry, it remains stagnant during the, uh, the period at 22% as average. Unemployment rate, a feature of post-reform economic growth in India is relatively slow growth of employment. After post-reform, the Indian economy is facing inability to generate sufficient number of jobs. Uh, after, uh, as the figure, we can see an increasing in unemployment rate during the period from 3.5% in 2010 and reached to 6.1% in 2017. Uh, the poverty and the inequality uh, gap. Uh, when we study any issue related to the economic growth, the first question, uh, who benefit from the growth? What about poverty? In the Indian, uh, in the Indian uh, case, the last uh, estimates on poverty show that poverty in India in 2011 was around 22% uh, percent of the uh, population below the uh, poverty line. After that, no statistic on poverty in India for the period 2011 until the present time. Uh, high economic growth has been accompanied by a, by a weakening of income disparity as the, the table we can analyze the income inequality in 2019 as uh, the world uh, database analyzing so we can see the top 10 of population get uh, more than half of income uh, in india 56 uh, percent of income go to the top 10 and top one take 21 percent of income half uh, percent of population take only 14.7 uh, percent of income and middle 40 taking 90 percent of income so the last thing the main findings and conclusion india is facing many challenges challenges to hiking economic growth which was 60.8 in 2018 in all factors agriculture manufacturing infrastructure india is experiencing a decline trend and the nation may find it difficult to attain seven growth rate period Slow growth in manufacturing, besides the decline in agriculture uh, growth, shrinking the share of local forests in this sector from national income. 
high level of inequality and uh, unemployment, poverty, damage, damage economic growth, and make those more valid claims. So as suggestion, government should focus on lo uh, local reform, attract investment to industry sector and manufacturing sector. So the growth of manufacturing uh, jobs is necessary to absorb the surplus in labor forests. And increasing income in, uh, growth in agriculture, it will help to increase and sustain uh, domestic demand uh, there and uh, supporting economic growth. Uh, thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Samir. Uh, this is a paper prepared with the help of secondary data. Right. We have looked into various factors which acted as challenges for economic uh, growth of India. Among the various factors, uh, which one do you believe as the most significant one? Uh, income inequality, because this uh, is this factor uh, related to demand, relating uh, to the domestic demand. So is this uh, represent uh, a key factor for, for growth uh, uh, and uh, uh, Yes, I think uh, uh, related to poverty, all this sector uh, central in this uh, uh, in income inequality. So uh, India uh, have the highest uh, rate of income inequality in all the world. This uh, main uh, India will facing is the future crisis uh, contain and sustainable across without uh, solving this uh, main issue. You mean the rich and the poor are so uh, distinct, large widening the gap between the rich and the poor? You mean uh, that? The gap after 2011, there's no any data in India about inequality, about poverty, all data missing. So any research want to make any real study, they will find a gap in research. So in this 10 years or 11 years, what happens about uh, Poverty, how benefit uh, benefit from this high growth economic? This main uh, question, uh, any research uh, should uh, uh, work uh, on this uh, subject. Okay. Now, Dr. Bijuti, you may. Uh, thank you, madam. Uh, Samir, I made a uh, description with the help of some indicators which are available uh, in the secondary sources. But my uh, question is whether you uh, analyze the secondary data, uh, the data available as the GDP growth, uh, uh, such, such kind of a serious analysis is not found uh, anywhere in your paper. Whether you made any such kind of an analysis? Uh, no, sir, only analyzing data, not make any uh, time series uh, testing. Uh, so uh, it's very, uh, why it should take long time. Therefore, in this uh, small paper, I try to only uh, uh, focus on this. Okay, you try to analyze the data, then only it will be enriched. And yes. Another thing is, uh, you use the indicators, the predictions made by certain agencies to assess the growth prospects of uh, uh, the Indian economy, but uh, that predictions are uh, only up to 2015. The indicators used are only up to 2015. And uh, your argument is that with the help of IMF data, you, you are uh, saying that uh, the economy will grow 7.7% .7 by 2024. What is your final conclusion? Whether it will grow 7.7%? Uh, .7 because now we are in 2021. Now at the World Bank, uh, but because uh, COVID-19 affects the World Bank, uh, with in your report, so the Indian uh, economy now slowed down by 10% in, uh, in this year. So uh, therefore, uh, uh, sir, I uh, uh, focus in, in this two, uh, two views to see. Uh, so before uh, COVID-19 or bef before 2018, all the organization, international uh, reports focusing, so uh, Indian economy will uh, contain uh, growth rate, uh, uh, high rate. But uh, after that, no, all the report focusing, so the Indian economy slow down, uh, having many uh, problems, many uh, imbalances. Uh, uh, 
that's uh, that's uh, yes. I agree. I agree with you on this main idea. Yeah. Okay, uh, and you also pointed out that, that there is a structural imbalance, especially uh, the agriculture sector. The contribution made by the agriculture sector is declining year by year. Huh? Uh, yes. What do you feel? Uh, the last uh, five six year, uh, five, uh, five six months, the farmer strike is going on. Huh? How it will affect uh, the uh, sectoral imbalance? So uh, I see, and this uh, we should uh, the government fo uh, focusing on the. Industry and manufacturer uh, sector, so by uh, and agriculture, so this real sector, so we can and so we know that uh, consumption and expenditure now in all uh, as China leading the growth uh, uh, by uh, increasing uh, income in this sector, uh, focusing in this sector, uh, public uh, service uh, uh, and uh, uh, improving the infrastructure in this sector, so we can. Uh, I think improving the growth if we focus in the real sector. So uh, the development of uh, uh, agriculture, industry, and manufacturing green sector, we cannot go by the uh, from service to uh, another uh, uh, sector. Okay, okay, that's all. Man. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, I may call upon the next presenter, Dr. Biju. Okay, now we are proceeding uh, to the second paper of the third track. Uh, the paper is on impact of multiple income sources on financial self-efficacy, a study on women MG and REG workers in Kerala. Uh, the, a paper uh, jointly by Abhijit P.S. and uh, Dr. Anthony Joseph K. Uh, both are from St. Bergman's College. Welcome, Abhijit. You can present. Hello, sir. Uh, hello, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, please. Sir, I'm sharing the screen. Sir, is the screen visible? Yes, it's visible. Hello. Uh, most honorable chairs and uh, dear delegates, uh, the topic for discussion is impact of multiple income sources on financial self-efficacy, study on women engineering workers in Kerala. Engineering uh, was launched in 2005 by the government of India as a flagship wage employment program to ensure the right to work for the poor. And uh, most of the studies, many studies in Jinarega found that the program is uh, very helpful in improving the uh, standard of living of uh, poor people in rural areas. And uh, the concept of self-efficacy was, uh, uh, was introduced by psychologist Albert Bandura in late 1970s, uh, which means that uh, the, the kind of confidence or uh, optimism that individuals have in certain domains of their life. So, Financial self-efficacy, as the name says, it is the sense of self-confidence that individuals have in their ability to manage financial affairs. And many of the studies found that financial self-efficacy is very helpful in improving the financial behavior and will help in achieving financial well-being for individuals. So coming to the statement of the problem, most of the studies related to energy or MG Narega in the past evaluated the micro aspects of the program. Now it is the uh, now 15 years have passed uh, after the launch of the program. And as the scheme is a wage employment program, it is necessary to know whether the financial infusion as a result of the program has instilled confidence in the people uh, in managing the funds at their disposal. So the objective of the study is to know whether there is a difference in the financial efficacy of human energy workers having extra income from sources other than NRGA and financial self-efficacy of, uh, of workers with NRGA income as the only source. That is, we have taken two categories of uh, NRGA workers, one having source, uh, source of income only from NRGA and others having alternative source of income. So the research methodology is uh, basically designed as uh, empirical work. As the population is large in numbers, we have taken uh, a small sample of 176 respondents from 12 wards in, across six panchayats in Ernakulam district of Kerala and the data of sources primary data. And we uh, 
we collected data using multi-stage cluster sampling technique from these 12 words. And that uh, and the tool for data collection was questionnaire method. Uh, the questionnaire was prepared in manual language. And the uh, tools for analysis uh, include mean, standard deviation, students, t-test. And we used the Jamovi software for analysis. And uh, the financial self-efficacy was measured uh, using a 10 statements self-developed scale for uh, financial self-efficacy, uh, which is a four-point Likert type scale. And uh, the overall financial self-efficacy was found to be 2.21, which is below 2.5. So it was below average. And the standard deviation was found to be 0 0.78. And uh, the demographic, uh, the, the, the financial self-efficacy scores based on demographic characteristics such as age, educational qualification, marital status, and experience with NRG are given. And uh, uh, coming to the main point, uh, the financial self-efficacy of people having alternate source of income, F people who said that they have an alter alternate source of income other than NREG was 2.67 with a standard deviation of 0 0.73, and people have in uh, and the fin uh, financial self-efficacy of people who have income solely from NREG was 2.10 with a standard deviation of 0 0.735, 753, and uh, uh, coming to the major analysis portion uh, where we set the hypothesis uh, that it's zero. There is no significant difference in the mean financial self-efficacy scores of respondents having and not having alternate, source of, uh, alternate income sources. And we used uh, the student's t-test. And uh, the results revealed a p-value less than 0 0.05. Hence, the HO was rejected, which means that the difference in mean financial self-efficacy scores of respondents having and not having alternative income sources is significant. So coming to the conclusion portion, uh, the study revealed that even though women in REG workers have below average levels of financial self-efficacy, those having income from more than one source score significantly better when compared with the ones who earn income only from an REG. So uh, we suggest that motivating workers to take up self-employment activities by creating thrift habits using the income from an REG would provide the much needed impetus for enhancing their financial self-efficacy. We have uh, gone through several uh, references for this, but only included the major ones here. Uh, uh, and thank you, sir. Thank you. Hello. Huh. Hello, madam. Uh, okay. Uh, your sample list. Huh. Vijay, shall I? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Your sample is 176 from 12 wards in six panchayats yes. in Arunachalam district. Okay. Uh, yeah. Here you wanted to compare between the financial efficacy of MNRG workers who are getting, I mean, income from this source alone and from some other sources also. That was yes, your purpose. Okay. Yeah. Yes, what about the sampling yeah. proportion? You have deliberately chosen a 50-50 ratio or you have collected no, no. the sample from no, a no. volunteer? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, we only... Uh, yeah, we we went to the workers. For, uh, we 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 use the uh, cluster sampling uh, technique, multi-stage cluster sampling. And when we met the respondents, there uh, there are uh, eighty percent of the respondents did not have any source of income other than NREG, and only twenty percent have income income source other than NREG. Okay, NREG income is uh, maximum of two twenty-five per day for for a maximum yeah, yeah. of yeah. hundred days. Then do you have any idea about the level of income from other sources for this 20% of your sample having income from multiple sources? We just only yeah. asked whether they have any income from source other than energy. Other than that, we did not ask them any, any other questions related to the, what kind of income they receive. What, what is whether the they are having or not, only that. Yeah, no. yeah. yeah not it is a simple any... analysis, madam. Yeah. We only use a very simple, simple analysis. Yes, Dr. Okay, Abhijit, uh, uh, in what way you uh, use this multi-stage cluster sampling? Uh, can you please elaborate uh, the process of sampling? Uh, the thing is that uh, I, I chose Ernakulam district first and I, I communicated with the NREGA headquarters in Trivandrum uh, of Kerala. And uh, they gave me the details of different panchayats and I, and I chose six panchayats. And uh, then I, I asked them to give the code, uh, numbers of uh, phone numbers of the different uh, uh, coordinators in the, across these panchayats. And from them, I collected uh, two, two wards each from uh, these six panchayats. 
and uh, from each 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 ward, I I I collect the data from all the uh, energy workers. Like I I I communicated with them, and I went went to uh, their work site uh, one day. Like one day means uh, in 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 each each ward, one day I went, and uh, from across like for for around within one one to two weeks, I collected the, the whole data. Is that multi-state cluster sampling? Yes, sir. Okay, you just check, check it out. Okay, uh, and the mean score of the financial self-efficacy of workers with experience yes. of six to ten years uh, yes. that is uh, found to be much low because it is only one point nine each. Now, yes, the, when their experiences uh, more, uh, the uh, financial self-efficacy is also like to uh, grow. Huh? Yes, sir. It should improve, but the thing is that I I found my result. I haven't manipulated the result. This is what I found. That is oh. why I'm. Why it is? I don't know why, so why it happened. Have any reasons? Uh, I don't know why it it happened like that, uh, but I found it. And what do you believe to be the major contribution of your study? Because uh, a person having more income will have more uh, financial self-efficacy. That is. Yes, uh, yes sir. That is you proved in your study also. That is proved, na. Right? Yes, sir. What is your contribution, X? The thing is that we found that people having alternative sources of income uh, have uh, better financial efficacy. So we should uh, improve. Uh, uh, we should and uh, provide them chances for uh, having more than or having alternate sources of income so that they can they can have better financial behavior and financial self efficacy. Okay, Abhijit. Okay, thank you. That's all, ma'am. Uh, thank you, sir. for the next person okay now the third paper is a study about gender differences in impulsive buying decisions among university postgraduate students in christ university bangalore uh, three authors two pg students and one assistant professor from christ deemed to be university they are invited to make the presentation Good morning, sir. Good morning, ma'am. Good evening, sir. Good evening, ma'am, and good evening to all of you. I am sharing the screen. Yes, please share your screen. Is the screen visible? Yeah, visible. Yes, sir. You should. Can I go to the first slide? Yes. My co-author will take over the session. Thank you. Our study is about the gender difference in impulsive buying decision among the university postgraduate student in Christ University, Bangalore City. Uh, so this is Bhuvika D and Ekar Mareshwar. We are doing this paper under the guidance of Dinesh Kumar sir. Yes, continue. Please continue. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir, is the next slide okay? Uh, so, what is impulsive buying? So, impulsive buying is buying any product or services before planning. Not audible. So, this is. Bhumika, a little more uh, louder, please. Yeah, you are not audible. Sir, now is it audible, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, buying any product or service before proper planning is known as impulsive buying. So, we see in our paper that there are a lot of internal and external factors. So, the internal factors we mostly saw was the psychological factors such as emotions, uh, feeling happiness. So, we do a lot of impulsive buying. When we see the external factors, it was mostly on the advertisement, the store layout planning and the design of the product. and majorly it was on the marketing strategy how the people use that might be the big billion day sale or the bonanza sale or uh, the end of season sale so people most early buy on this type of the impulsive buying so unplanned purchase behavior is a primary cause of impulsive buying and illogical thinking and the marketer use impulsive buying on the customer to increase their sales and improve their profit today customers are mostly influenced to impulsive buying and uh, it is mainly due to the self control uh, due to the lack of self control we do a lot of impulsive buying 
next slide. Uh, the statement of the problems we saw was uh, uh, in the modern advanced world, impulsive buying uh, tends to change from time to time. And it is the pattern of impulsive buying is different in different set of people. And especially the impulsive buying is seen in the younger generations. Uh, and uh, there is a very less study which is done on impulsive buying, especially in the PG students in the university level. And the degree of uh, responsive of gender is mainly focused among the PG students. Uh, the main objective of the study was to find the difference in the gender of the impulsive buying. Is there any significance? And to find what are the factors which are effective impulsive buying among the university PG students. The methodology, uh, we, have uh, we have collected a primary data using a questionnaire method. Uh, we have uh, circulated to the PG student and the questionnaire was prepared by self basis and with the guidance of our uh, guide. And the questionnaire contains the demographic information about the PG student and the questions were for set of 15 questions were there, which had yes or no type of question. And the sample size was 88 and 44 were male and 44 were female. And the SPSS software was used to do the analysis. And we used the percentage analysis and chi-square test was conducted to do the analysis. Analysis of the study, the hypothesis here H0 is there is no significant difference between the impulsive buying among the university students. And then uh, alternative hypothesis, there is an uh, association with the gender imp in impulsive buying among the postgraduates. And there were 15 set of questions, which, which was yes or no. And the sample size was 88, where 44 were male and 44 were female. Uh, so I'll be telling you the result which we got uh, while we collected the questionnaire. So uh, the first question was uh, people who told yes for impulsive buying. Uh, so when we see the male percentage was 75 and the female were 92, 93.2. Uh, so here we saw a significant difference. So there was a gender difference. So the female percentage who are, who are doing impulsive buying were more. So there is a gender difference we could see here. And when we, the next question was how when people feel happy, will they do impulsive buying? So the male population was 70% told yes. And in the female, 86.4% told yes. So again, it was a female. But in when we conducted the chi-square test. You are expected to give the major findings only, na? Question by question, it is not necessary, okay? Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Sure, sir. Uh, so I'll be just generalizing, sir. Uh, so when there was a gender difference, uh, which proved uh, like women or male, which uh, did more impulsive buying, the questions were like, yes, impulsive buying was done for male and female. And the marketing and promotion again showed there was a gender difference. And uh, the unhappy, when people were unhappy after doing the impulsive buying, it showed male had more tendency of doing this. And other factors were showing there was no significant difference between the male and the female. It was generalizedly done, sir. Right. Okay, Bumedia, uh, we appreciate your effort uh, for doing this research, but I'm interested to know how, what made you to choose such a small group for your research? Oh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, actually, ma'am, when we saw, when we were collecting the articles for reviewing, uh, and when we saw it was a very few analysis was done on the students, especially on the PG students. There mm -hmm. was very less uh, reports were collected in this, sir. So we felt uh, there was a scope of doing in this among the PG students. That was the uh, first intention. So because when we saw it, there was a very less study which was done in this sector. Okay, anyway, we hope in the further years of your research, you, you will come up with more, uh, I mean, elaborate segments for your research. And you are done your study with yes or no type questions. That is also yes. something not which is not perfect, something which is not perfect. Some scaling you may have to do. Uh, we hope you will learn more about the use of uh, research. I mean, how the outcome will be useful. Okay, Dr. Biju. Yes, madam. Uh, Bhumika, all, madam pointed out uh, two important things, uh, two important shortcomings of your paper. The 
the very first one is uh, you have opted a small group and that to the postgraduate students. The problem uh, with the postgraduate students uh, is this, they have no income of their own. Uh, and then uh, uh, by studying the buying behavior or uh, the impulsive buying characteristics and all, you have to uh, select uh, uh, an adequate uh, number with the uh, uh, characteristics and all. And by simply asking yes. dichotomous questions, yes or no questions on buying behavior, uh, we cannot be able to assess the impulsive buying behavior. Huh? So uh, for that, you can use uh, some scales or something like that. Okay. Then in the in your findings, in some cases, uh, you pointed out that uh, in the second finding, in some cases, male students are more impulsive than female students. In what all areas uh, the male students have more uh, uh, impulsive than female students? Yes. Do you identify the areas? Yes, sir. It was on, uh, in few of that was like unhappy after doing the impulsive buying. Uh, it showed uh, the male was more responsive. And uh, another thing is um, in your uh, suggestions part, in your findings part itself, uh, you stated some reasons for impulsive buying also huh? by this uh, yes or no questions alone how do you analyze the reasons for impulsive buying sir the thing was the percentage of people agreeing we we took it sir and many article also suggested uh, in the recent time of the credit card uh, usage and the excess of pocket money sir okay uh, you just have to uh, look into it seriously no Okay. Yes, sir. Sure. Sir. Okay. Okay. A very good. Thank Congratulations you, for your effort. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. So, shall we yes. proceed to the next paper, ma'am? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. So, the next paper is on the effective application of blockchain technology in enabling ease of doing business in India by Jin C. P. Babu, assistant professor, Mark Gregorius College of Law. So, welcome, Jin C. P. Babu. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, 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 you are audible. Sir, uh, I'll share my presentation. Jin C. P. Babu, please share your slide. Uh, so, one second, I'm getting a bit trouble in sharing. Sorry, sir, I'm not able to share my slide. Um, so, okay, so, did you, sir, uh, yeah. uh, you please ask the uh, okay. you wait boss. and uh, you please contact uh, Aparna for that. And uh, by the time we can have another presentation, so you have yeah, uh, okay. the next person in the meantime. Let us go to the next presentation. The type. Topic is the indie music industry and its growth. Uh, Nivaj Gogoi and Krishna Prasad. Yes. A PG Hello, scholar ma from Department of Commerce of Christ University and Assistant Professor, Department of Christ University, Department of Commerce and Christ of Christ University. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Am I audible? Yeah, this is this is what I mentioned uh, uh, in the beginning. Some titles are conveying itself, but this uh, we may need an introduction. What is indie music? 
Yes, yeah, let us sure. listen to Nibaj. Yes, uh, is my screen visible, ma'am? Yes, definitely. Yes, okay. go ahead. Okay, okay. So, hello everyone. Uh, so, my myself, Nibaj. And my, unfortunately, my co-author, who is also my professor, Krishna Prasad, he is unable to attend this session. So I'll be carrying on alone this session. So without wasting any time, I would like to give the introduction. So first of all, I'd like to say what is, what does indie music mean? So indie is nothing but the short form of the word independent. So indie music, it will simply mean the music created by the independent artist or music band. So there are many people uh, youth, even uh, especially in this COVID-19 pandemic, you, you might have seen in YouTube, many musicians are coming up, all producing and creating music at their home. So they are the independent artists, not signed by any major labels. So what do we mean by major labels? So these are nothing but the best example will be PCs or Sony Music or Savan Music that, that are partnering its business in India. So what they do, they spot the potential talents so uh, they uh, sign them and they uh, manage everything for them, like from starting to end managing their careers, their financial aspects, then creating their music. And the most important thing is promoting and marketing their music. So the reason why major labels are able to do it because they, they have huge res resources. So they can, and they also have their significant effects in the market. So if suppose Sony Music has signed any artists, they have released their music. So obviously it will reach out to like almost the whole country. So their reach is uh, wider than the other independent levels. But one restriction is that uh, major levels, it is very hard to get signed by them for an artist. And also they will give you some restrictions. So they uh, accept music kind of a uh, more of a business. So they will uh, see who, to, who will be more beneficial for them, profitable for them. They will follow the current trends and they will uh, manage the careers of the artists. But independent levels, they, what they, they focus more on the creative part. So they will give full autonomy and independence to the artists. You create your music. And, but the level of marketing will be less for the independent levels because they do not have the huge resources owned by the major levels. So the whole world, we can, like any musician you've, uh, heard about Taylor Swift or Sean Mendes, anyone in the international industry, music industry. So they begin their careers as an indie artist only. Later on, they are signed by labels and they their careers flourish, uh, flourishes all over the world. And in India also, lately we've seen the local ten Parvas. They are the one of the biggest indie artists and Pratik what he has broke the internet last year when Barack Obama has listed his top 20 favorite songs of 2020. And his song Colmes was one of them. After that, he has become an international artist, and now as he he's the like brightest indie mu uh, musician in the country. If we talk about, then why do we, have I chosen this topic as my research problem? So there are many reports showing that indie music industry is growing. So all over the world, uh, from 2017 to 2018, there was a jump of 35 percent of increase in revenues by this industry. But still. Like uh, other research, research, research uh, they show that like 59% of all the Indian artists, they face financial crisis because their revenue is not enough to take music as their only profession. And in India, like their average, uh, an Indian artist's average income is US dollar 12,000 to 13,000, which is compared to like half of the other label artists which is around US dollar of 25,000 on an average. In India also, I've stated in the PPT, like the average income is from 15,000 to 30,000 in India, which is very less because the artist is not alone in the team. If it is a music band, there will be at least three members, there will be other team members. So in the end, a very small chunk of money will be left for each of the members. Then in the industry music is not very well organized in India. So our research studies showed that 42% of the artists, they face difficulties in collecting their payments. They will have late payments and another 42%, they don't receive their uh, money at all. Like suppose there was a show, their organizers, organizers do not pay them. And so that leaves only 16% of the Indian artists in India who actually get paid fairly and uh, timely, on a timely manner. And uh, the last problem in India is that the, whenever we talk about the music industry in India, it is completely dominated by Bollywood. There is a Bollywood monopoly in the Indian music industry. 
most of the people do not even they haven't even heard about what indie music industry is actually about and when it comes to entertainment sources india is heavily dominated by uh, bollywood and cricket so indie music industry has not attracted, attracted many like attention from the people so the objective of the people if i talk about the overall objective i just wanted to make a study uh, collecting sec, uh, data that how the industry is uh, performing at the current stage uh, both on a national and international level and also i wanted to make people aware of the importance of this industry from an economic and social point of view so in india itself in 2018 uh, around 1 120 million dollars of revenues were earned by this industry in india itself so it is a huge part of the it can form a huge part of the gdp and also it the best part is that it attracts foreign currencies also because if an artist performs outside they will get uh, paid in foreign currencies they will bring it home and from a social point of view if the best example i give is that i can we can now see uh, the music industry of korea south korea so their k-pop industry has completely taken over uh, the world's music industry their whole country is now represented by the represented by the music industry only so a culture is of a country is represented by the music culture of the country also so for the as for the methodology so most of uh, i have collected secondary data from some reliable sources reliable and reputed so there are articles from research get request say journals and jstor and also there are very few articles covering this topic so i had to go for some e magazines or e magazines and e articles and most of them are from forbes then rolling stone india all are reputed and verified and also to give a more importance depth to the study i have taken interviews of two indian artists and they have given their responses through social i have com communicated with them through social media uh, platforms on instagram and whatsapp and the <clears throat> analysis part so in the end i've after doing all the researches all the from the review of literature as well as from the interview of the two artists i have received uh, i have come to the the conclusion that yes, the indie industry is increasing, no doubt in that, and also India, on uh, India is also no exception to that. It is increasing, but it is very true that there are very less support from the people as well as for the from the organization. But uh, still, people like more and more artists are coming day to the uh, daily. Uh, you can see on YouTube, Apple Music, everywhere, because now it is it has become very like less costly and also easier to produce music you can just buy a laptop and a mic and you can produce music from inside your four walls of your room only so many artists are coming in into the industry and online platforms obviously once you have uh, produced any music it has very it is very easy to release your music on online platforms which will, i'll uh, explain later again then india from february to march there are very various shows uh, from September to March, it is a festive season of music in India. There will be many festivals all across the country, Pune, uh, Mumbai. Okay, Nima, proceed yes, to sir. your uh, major findings and uh, conclusions. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Sure. So this this is so after reviewing everything, I have come come up with this model of suggestion. So it it is nothing but the product cycle of the indie music uh, uh, industries. So first they will obviously have to create the music, then they have to release it. And the most important part is promoting and marketing. So I wanted to give more emphasis in that. So how do you market yourself? So there will be some push and pull marketing strategies. First of all, you have to make it make your music available in on, online platforms, for example, Spotify, YouTube, Apple Music, iTunes, everything. Then once you gather like uh, once you make a name of yourself in the industry, you will get live shows like in pubs, bars, cafes. You can go for live shows, which will give you uh, some revenues for your music. Then, then comes music festivals. So, music festivals is the highest point of these live shows. There will be uh, international artists coming in, so you will get more audience. So, it is easier to reach out to people, but it's also not so easy to get music festivals to be a part of the music festivals. Then. The best and the cheapest one is word of mouth. So here I've in the bracket, I have given E1. So it is nothing but word of mouth through online platforms. So suppose I have listened to a song, I liked it, I will send it over to my friends through WhatsApp or Instagram. So that is the best policy, but it is the artist has no control over it. Only the only key to this E1 is that you have to make your music good so that the audience will like and share. 
then after the whatever revenue you generate you can plan for your future uh, music and you again the whole cycle begins until and unless you are getting signed by any major label or you know, like any other parties take over your career management so that would be my references and that's all thank you in the match uh, yes, this is a new topic uh, congratulations but i doubt uh, in the current times, anything and everything is sold through YouTube and people are making uh, lakhs and lakhs of rupees. No, in that current yes, context, yes. is this indie musicians are in, in such a great trouble to market their product? Yes, ma'am, because yes. Ma if you look at the YouTubers, so they are, uh, most of the famous YouTubers, they are known for podcasting and like bloggings and all. So not much of them are from indie artists because indie artists, it's hard for them to promote their music. And these are not, so music is something like a small people crowd will listen to the, that particular kind of music. But post podcasts or blogs, everyone will, like for time pass and all, everyone watches it so it trends easily. But for the indie artists, it's hard to like get themselves on the stage to send their music forward. So there, there's a, obviously a facing issue for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, regarding the financing, uh, there is the, I feel, I personally feel there is the opportunity of crowdfunding also as we have seen successfully in entertainment industry as a whole. Anyway, over yes, to my coach here, Professor Biju. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Can okay, you watch? Uh, it's a good attempt, but uh, I just want to know from you, It is. is it just a conceptual paper? Uh, yes, sir. Like, so what I tried to do is I wanted to study about the whole uh, industry and I just wanted to uh, give them a suggestion depending on the reviews, especially in more emphasizing on the marketing part. If you see my full article, then you'll understand that like, whatever factors I've found through the whole article. So I've just collected them and suggested to the artist that you can use these factors or these platforms to promote. Okay. Yourself. Okay. So you claim that uh, the indie music industry is uh, uh, growing uh, day by day. So yes. what statistics uh, you will give in support of your claim that uh, the industry is growing? Yes, sir. So uh, in the original report, like the full report, I have uh, given many statistical uh, reviews. So in, uh, the 30 uh, once uh, one I've already told 35 percent of jump was from 27 to 2018. Then in 2018 in India itself, around 120 million dollars of digital music was sold, and also six and in total 1,700 billion streams were done in India itself only online music and video. So it is clearly, but the problem is it is in, it is going to but the ratio of the successful in the industries compared to the like total number of industries. They are not able to be successful. The ratio is less, but it's growing for sure. In the last slide, you pointed out a model itself. Huh? What, uh, uh, in what way you created this model? So the model is, uh, so I have talked to the to uh, take an interview of the two artists. So they have I have talked to them and like uh, whatever the factors. So. In the review of literature and in a problem problem statement, so most of the the main problem was that they were not able to market themselves. So whatever when, factor is, so I have some that, models. Uh, you should have uh, enough data support, analysis, and uh, the, the results and all. Okay. Huh? Yes, yes, I, oh, I second, completely. Second. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Shall we call the next person, ma'am? Yes, sir. You may take up. Uh, Biju sir, what about the uh, Jinsi's issue? Uh, sir, uh, the, sir, the Jinsi's uh, slide have been sent to the coordinator. Uh, so that will be uh, put from Aparna's side and then Jinsi will present her presentation. So shall we call her now? Uh, yes, sir, you can call her. Okay, Jinsi, now you can uh, start your presentation. Sorry, sir, and sorry, ma'am, for an inconvenience code. No issues. Abana, no issues. Abana, can you please upload the slide? Okay, uh, a very warm good afternoon uh, to one and all present. Myself, Jinsi. Uh, I'm assistant professor in commerce, Narvigorius College of Law, Nalantara. And my topic is the effective application of blockchain technology in enabling ease of doing business in India. 
moving to the introduction area uh, see digitalization one of the most essential factor for efficient and flexible ease of doing business and trade. Uh, since 2015, Government of India have adopted D Digital India and which, uh, which marked a paradigm shift in planning and governance. Uh, so the economic liberalization enhanced along, along the lines of digital transformation marks the next generation trade and business reforms in Indian economy. Ease of doing business is an index uh, developed and published by the World Bank Group uh, from 2003, which analyzes the procedures, time taken and cost involved in the life cycle of establishing and running a business through 10, 10 different quantitative parameters. And the major aim of such an initiative is to create pressure on government to introduce business friendly laws in a country. In 2008, Sashi, uh, Sashi Nakamoto, an unidentified person or a group, have developed Bitcoin, which is considered as the base of blockchain technology. And it is defined as distributed ledger technology that stores information in multiple systems and enables peer-to-peer -peer transaction, which secures data cryptographically. And the present economic scenario demands digitalization prompted with investment-friendly trade practices for the economic development of a country. Moving to the statement of problem, uh, see, from being criticized as a non-investor-friendly destination, so we were 142nd in 2014 with respect to the position, and from 2020 report, we secured and we are uh, 63rd out of 190 countries. However, with respect to enforcing contracts, it is 163rd for registering property, it is 154th. And we take almost 58 days in registering a property. Then the cost involved uh, on an average is 7.8 percent. And it takes almost 145 days to resolve commercial disputes in India. So this is a paper which is an attempt to analyze the effective application of blockchain technology in enabling ease of doing business in India so that we can create a more investor friendly atmosphere and be among the top slots. Moving to the objectives of uh, the paper of the study, it is to analyze the problems faced in doing business in India along the lines, lines of ease of doing business in text. Then secondly, to identify the areas where blockchain technology can be applied to solve the problems in case of uh, in ease of doing business. The research methodology mainly used is a uh, 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 literature review and I have found out the data from uh, Niti Aayog draft discussion paper which was released in 2020 and then uh, blockchain technology national strategy which was released in 2021 by the Ministry of uh, Electronics and um, Communication. Then the World Bank reports, the World Economic Forum survey uh, then journal, newspaper, and from the website of Ministry of Finance. The major findings and results are as follows. See, as we all know, due to high level of competition, globalization, and rapid digitalization, also there is an increased influence and importance of business in governance and development. And this demands a government all over the world to adopt uh, more and more trade and investor-friendly policies. So. Ease of doing business, as I said, is established by the World Bank Group and it indicates the better and simpler regulations for doing business along with stronger protection for property rights. It has a wide range of popularity among the different countries because it is a potential investment guide to potential investors. So it indicates uh, the regulatory atmosphere in a country, it depicts the rate of safety and ensure for investment. And this table shows the comparison of 2019 ranking and 2020 and the different parameters as um, along with this. So uh, the parameters, the 10 different quantitative parameters analyzed are starting a business, dealing with construction permit, getting electricity, registering, uh, registering property, uh, getting credit, protecting minority investors, paying taxes, trading across borders, enforcing contracts, re uh, resolving insolvency. See, we can see a major increase in the uh, ranking of different areas like uh, construction permit. We have a uh, major, uh, we, are we have moved forward. So then with respect to getting electricity, then resolving uh, insolvency. In general, we can sum up that the 
that it is due to the uh, major economic reforms or business reforms adopted by the recent government so it can be uh, like uh, like with respect to introduction of an online single window mechanism for company incorporation then we have reduced reduced corporate taxes then there were amendments to the companies and introduction of uh, insolvency and bankruptcy court then we have a strengthened um, we have strengthened a computerized risk and case management system to ensure it, ensure transparency and in in inspection in spite of all these development and all these activities there are certain problems which remain unaddressed and the problems are uh, so the problems are there are huge cost involved in starting a business then the cost for getting electricity construction uh, connection is low but the number of procedures involved makes it an attractive the number of procedures inter and intermediaries involved for registering a property, availing credit and in, 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 in enforcement of contract, and the delays and pendency of cases and commercial uh, investors, the concerns of minority in investors. See, actually, uh, this consists of transparency of transaction, then the liability for uh, self-leading dealing, and uh, the shareholders' ability to sue officers directors for misconduct and finally the lack of capacity to levy taxes effectively see next one how blockchain blockchain technology can be can be applied blockchain technology can play a pivotal role in employment generation capital creation and also solving the basic problems of a country along with global strategic positioning the main features of blockchain technology is our first one uh, elimination of intermediaries of trust say it is a number of uh, you can say there are a number of regulatory bodies or number of formalities is, uh, existing in india see it helps see as it is an inherent um, feature of blockchain technology is that it in uh, it enables in eliminating the intermediaries of trust so we can eliminate a lot of financial intermediaries unnecessary unnecessary or unwanted financial intermediaries next <clears throat> Shared ledger, see it uses a decentralized data sharing mechanism. So uh, the data is distributed over different uh, locations and it can, uh, it helps in eliminating a single point vulnerability. Uh, automation of st uh, smart contracts, see the blockchain technology enables self-contracting, uh, self-executing contracts, which uh, written in con written in codes that can be executed with, with the help of a triggering event. Next, digital footprint. Each and every transaction is secured cryptographically and is protected by a unique digital signature. So any alteration uh, without a dis uh, disturbing the previous record is not possible. Creation of digital assets, uh, then data integrity and security as verification of mistakes are easier. Uh, then peer-to-peer -peer transaction and finally faster processing. So moving to the next slide, it says about the areas where we can use these features. So we can use, I mean, we can make use of re, uh, blockchain technology for creation of a single electronic platform for trade stake um, for state trading with stakeholders. Then it can be used in issuance of digital certificates and development of an e-land registry. We can use a blockchain technology in implementation of computerized central inspection system. Uh, we can use it in speedy and uh, transparent uh, transaction, then reduction in uh, corruption and streamline of payments. Can you conclude? Yes. Because we are running. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, the the technology we can use uh, these in all these areas, and finally to conclude, uh, digitalization is the most essential thing. Uh, we have different Indian initiatives like Make in India, Digital India, Atmanirbhar Bharat, and Startup India. Uh, by using blockchain technology, we can make use. Uh, we can it has an immense potential, and we can uh, develop a develop a uh, business on the lines of ease of doing business index. Thank you. Thank you. Madam, you are in mute. Yeah, where is Mar Grigori's College of Law? It is in Nala and Chirama. You should specify that also because you should make your institution also visible. You are representing your institution. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. 
okay. it, uh, yeah, made a good attempt connecting the uh, see how India can uh, make use of the blockchain technology for improving the ease of doing position. Well, good. India has made so many sincere efforts, be it Make in India, be it yes. Startup India, Stand Up India. But looking at the outcome, you have not yet reached any satisfactory mm, results. Eh? Okay, so yes, there may be something which cannot be managed by easily managed, hmm? yes. which yes. act as yes. uh, hindrances for a better, better uh, easy, easy, I mean, ease of doing position for India, making India a Okay, anyway, we should make further explorations into the area. Anyway, we, I appreciate the effort. Hmm? Thank you. Thank you. Sir. As we are running short of time, I am not asking anything because uh, uh, it is only a conceptual paper, isn't it? Uh, and, uh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Teacher, as you are from uh, the education field, uh, uh, what's your opinion about the newly uh, implemented digi locker system by MHRD? Even our university is insisting that. Okay, so sir, I think um, it can. So I'm not much aware. So if uh, generally, what I can that... say about it is, uh, if we have a digital in, okay, if we if we want to uh, if we want to survive in this particular system, we need to go paperless more and more so uh, i think it is a better initiative but as ma'am said you cannot say the um the satisfaction i mean you, you cannot say how much it is going to benefit each and everyone see recently with the respect to online education everyone is saying about the digital device we have still a server and we don't know how much we can do. it is a good initiative um we can do much so, uh, with respect to the governance but i don't know how much we can do. Uh, I just asked because we are also using this uh, uh, blockchain technology only. That's why I asked. Okay. Uh, okay anyway, uh, thank you. And now, now we are proceeding to the next presentation. Take up the next paper, sir. Okay. Uh, so the next uh, presentation by Arsha Hari and Ananya B, the Infill Scholars of the Department. Okay. Good afternoon, Start sir. Your Good Good afternoon, sir, and good afternoon, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, I shall share the presentation. Ma'am, is my screen visible? Yes, yes. session hello it's okay asha okay. uh, ma'am ananya will be starting the session so is she online ananya online yes ma'am am i audible Yes, 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 you can press it back. Respect the chair of this session, Rasya ma'am and Biju sir, and all the delegates present here. Good afternoon, one and all. Myself, Aninya, and I am here with my co-author, Arsha. We are from Department of Commerce, University of Kerala. Today, we are going to make a presentation on topic corporate governance in India, concepts, framework, and some consideration in the amid of COVID outbreak. Before moving on to the presentation, I would like to highlight the words of Toba Beta. Good corporate governance, it's about being prosper and proper. Now look at what you are going Please, please, yeah, give your mic. Continue your presentation. Ananya Asha, 
please continue your presentation because we are running short of time okay okay ma'am i will continue with the presentation so what we are going to cover today includes the objectives and research methodology then we will move on the screen is not visible screen is not visible sir i'll share once more Are now visible, sir? Yes. Yes, yes. Please yes. go ahead. Asha, I'll continue. Okay. okay. Today we are going to discuss. Okay. Can you? Yeah. Okay. Proceed to the next slide. Uh, you don't want to explain the contents now. Proceed to next slide. Okay. Objectives. to identify all concepts related to corporate governance to identify the legal framework that governs corporate governance in india and to study the corporate governance and considerations during covid pandemic methodology this is a descriptive study which is purely based upon secondary data conceptualizing corporate governance in order to conceptualize corporate governance we need to understand both the terms corporate and governance corporate simply means the legal entities that exist independently of the person or persons and governance means the framework of rules that are necessary in order to tackle the problems which are faced by the organization business entities etc thus applying the concept of governance in the corporate world we get the term corporate Corporate governance. So you can say that corporate governance is a structure of rules, practices, and processes that are used to direct and manage a company. This is a four fundamental pillars of corporate governance. So the first one is accountability. Accountability means the corporate governance framework should provide for strategic guidance of the company, effective monitoring of management by the board, and board accountability for the company and shareholder. Hello, sir. Uh, sir, your uh, mic is mute, sir. You don't want to explain uh, each and every pillars. Uh, you just uh, uh, tell the four pillars and uh, proceed to the next slide. Okay. The four pillar fundamental pillars of corporate governance are accountability, transparency, responsibility, and fairness. Next is the theories of corporate governance. First one is agency theory. It uh, defines the relationship between the principals and agents. And according to this the theory, the principal delegates the works of running business to the directors or managers. Next is the stewardship theory. It implies a, implies that the stewards protects and maximizes the shareholders' wealth through improving the firm's performance. And third is the stakeholders theory. The theory focuses on the managerial decision making and the interest of the stakeholders. And uh, next is the resource dependency theory. Uh, it deals with the role of board of directors in providing all the uh, necessary resources which are required by the firms in order to carry out its operations. And next is the transaction cost theory. As the corporate firm will be having a number of contracts with the external uh, parties, uh, there is a cost which is associated with each contract. That is called the transaction contract. And last one is the political theory. It uh, deals with the concept of developing uh, voting as a support from the stakeholders of the firm rather than purchasing voting power. Now the remaining portions will be presented by Arsha. So, uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. Proceed. Hello, sir. Yes, yes. Proceed. Proceed. Ah, okay. Move on to the corporate governance. We'll move on to the Indian corporate governance overview. So, governance was first identified in India thousands of years back. Veda, the oldest book on in the whole world. Honey and symphony among all the states. Holders that is to pay prosperity for all was the common corporate. In the dangers of divergence and chances of conflict in individual and organizational objective, corporate disclosure in India is at the center stage of reform. Institutional investors and institutions wish equitable statements to understand the key financial investors or which they plan to invest. In corporate governance, as is. 
importance mainly in the economic liberalization and deregulation of industry and business. In governing that forms the basis of for the functioning of corporate governance. The corporate governance in companies at 2013 includes the companies that from the series clause 29 of the statement. As per this act, corporate governance is mandated for listed and unlisted companies. Section 149 of the Companies Act specifies about the board of directors and its composition, where a minimum of three directors are public, corporate, and is of a private. The maximum of directors can be 15. It can be more with subject to special approval. Uh, approval. Then coming to section 149.3, it deals with Woman director and a resident director. A woman director is necessary in company having a paid up share capital of 100 crore or more or having a turnover of 300 crore or more. Resident director is a person who has been in India now for a period of not less than 182 days. Section 149. Proceed to the last part, Arsha. Proceed to the last part. Woman director. Uh, section 1. Okay, okay, sir. I'll move. Uh, stakeholder relationship committee is specified in 186 uh, and, uh, and okay. Uh, internal investigation findings. office is specified in section. Okay. okay. And we are aiming to find out what the wake of corporate governance in the midst of COVID. Uh, uh, and uh, we found out that. Uh, corporate governance plans and the business to ensure transparency and fairness, but the pandemic has inserted cost to the working of governance structure. But many companies with a good corporate governance have survived the pandemic better than compared to other in institutions. But the challenges and issues regarding the corporate governance practices in India during the time of pandemic includes the disruptions caused in the conduct of meetings, uh, like the call, required column, place of conduct of meetings, the frequency of its conduct, uh, the virtual conduct of annual general meetings. There were also problems relating to the continuity of the business, disaster recovery, dividend and liquidity management, risk control, and internal measures. There were certain relaxations mentioned in the Companies Act uh, for, the, for the period of conduct of meetings, period of submission of audit reports, etc. were extended uh, in the view of uh, presentation also. There were certain relaxations in the regulations, publication of the and dates for filing of certain regulations. Also, uh, also, corporate affairs with respect to COVID-19 can be considered as a So, uh, to conclude, general uh, concept of the corporate governance, which aim at the objective of profit maximization and shareholder welfare, companies have placed a major role in framing the legal framework for the government of the country, and uh, the participation of the world gave post to all the activities in the functioning of corporate governance, but the companies with a stronger governance structure face the pandemic more dynamically than others. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Asher. Dr. Biju A.V., the organizing secretary, you may intervene, and then and there for, for the purpose of management of time, you are free to intervene. Uh, we have yeah. four more purpose. We have four more purpose. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, announce the time. Each candidate can take. It's uh, five, uh, almost I five right now. Uh, six minutes presentation. Next four papers. Okay. okay. All the four paper presenters, please listen to the uh, time frame available to you. Five minutes. Okay. With five this, minutes and uh, one minute for discussion. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Ashra Hari, without discussion, we are moving to the next paper. That's the difficult thing. When the presenter is in the big stage, the session, the people has to intervene for stopping. That's the most difficult thing. Anyway, let us go to the next paper. Okay. Financial, inclusion, financial inclusion of SHGs through microfinance for poverty eradication and upliftment of living standards. A study of uh, some select microfinance units of Bellari. Okay. I think we need not uh, uh, tell the title and uh, it, anyway, it will come in the presentation. Okay. Hereafter, the present the remaining purpose can enter one after another when you are called upon. Okay. When we say the next presenter, you can join 
with your title and your, I mean, name and organization. Okay, welcome. Hello. Yes. Ma'am, uh, am I audible? Audible, yeah. Audible, you share your screen. There we go. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, just a minute. Please try to share your screen because we don't have time. Uh, Mom, yeah, is the screen is working? Oh, it is working. Working. Start presentation. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, one and all. Respect the chairs of the session. Uh, Dr. Azia, ma'am, and Dr. Biju, sir. Uh, uh, anyhow, ma'am is, uh, you know, uh, given the title of the uh, presentation, so I'll directly move to uh, my presentation. Uh, so, financial inclusion is an act of uplifting the living standards of poor people living in rural, urban, and semi-urban areas by providing financial support through loan from banks, insurance agencies, and financial institutions. Uh, so, the concept of microfinance uh, is not a new concept. It's uh, the its origin has been traced back to the year 1976. Uh, the, uh, the concept was uh, bought by the uh, Professor Muhammad Yunus from Bangladesh. So, he set up a Grameen model uh, in order to, uh, you know, provide loans uh, for the poor and underdevelopment uh, sections of the community that is women. So, according to the Grameen Bank model, um, the model was, I mean, uh, this model uh, program, uh, you know, in this Grameen Bank model program, Participants are organized into groups of five members where they make a mandatory contribution to group savings and insurance fund. So each member maintains her individual saving and loan account with the bank. And after conducting, um, sorry, contributing to the savings fund for a fixed time, the group members receive individual loans from the bank. But the group is not risk, uh, is not required to give any guarantee for the repayment by its member. So by this, you uh, know, concept of Grameen Bank that is supporting the poor and underdeveloped, you know, rural women in order to, you know, uplift her living standard. So uh, there are plenty of opportunities where, you know, women, uh, because today you can see like you know, women uh, is empowered in many sectors. You can find women in every uh, sectors of the, you know, uh, activity. So she is a pilot and she is into every sector. So it is, it is a need, um, you know, that women to be uh, brought up in order to show her ability. So in this uh, backdrop, an attempt is made uh, in order to understand whether through microfinance is really the, there is an upliftment, upliftment of uh, living standards of women or not. So uh, the main statement of the problem which I have identified is the rural, uh, you know, there are so many reasons why, you know, uh, women are not empowered. It might be because of the socially backward region. They, are, they might be illiterate and uh, they have very little motivation or very low motivation and poor economic base. So it, it is, um, you know, it is a need of the heart to see, uh, to bring up, um, you know, such issues from the rural and to empower. There are so many ways where, you know, women are empowered through microfinance units. Uh, in, even, you know, government of India is also acting a very important role in the upliftment by introducing the Mudra Yojana uh, from the further year 2015 and uh, 16, where you know the concentration is uh, provided, uh, you know mudra by this mudra yojana, uh, uh, you know loans are provided for the microfinance institutions through which women can you know get this uh, finance for the you know for fulfilling their various needs. So the main objective of this paper is to interpret the influence of microfinance and the socio-economic empowerment of women. women. To inspect the impact of financial inclusion of SHGs for poverty eradication and the standard of living. To study whether the credit provided was used only for the consumption purpose or it was used for economic development as well. So, in order to fulfill the objective set for the study, uh, I'd be, be, you know, uh, the study was conducted based on stratified sampling where you know the uh, population, I mean, uh, the chosen population was di divided into different groups. Um, you know, usually microfinance, uh, I mean, self help groups are created taking a group of you know, 6 to 10 members. So, uh, out of this 200 respondents we have studied using structured questionnaire uh, in order to identify so many aspects of the study. 
So we understood, like, we wanted to know whether the what are the products and services of microfinance, like uh, there are micro credit, micro savings, micro insurance, and micro finance training. And also, we wanted to understand whether they really got satisfied with the credit obtained. And the credit obtained were really used in order to increase the saving or uh, for, you know, is it really? Ma'am, uh, please go to your findings because already three minutes over. Okay, sir. So, the main findings we understood that, you know, respondents agreed that there was an improvement in the social status and the standard of living because the amount which they were receiving from microfinance were usually. Uh, you know, useful for them to build up a small businesses. They were using it for medical expenses, education to the children, consumption and for household expenditure. Um, the trainings imparted have an impact on their lives in terms of cleanliness, health awareness, sanitation, food and work, but few people are unable to decide or respond on their own. So regular, it's not that, you know, uh, through a self-help groups only finance were provided for their upliftment, but regular trainings. So they used to meet, meet weekly ones to understand the problems faced by them. And training were given for them because since rural people are most of you know, mostly of illiterate, so they were not aware about the basic you know uh, uh, concepts like cleanliness, health awareness, and all. So trainings were provided for them to educate regarding that. And uh, it was uh, no, it was also understood from the study that you know the credits which were given for them were misused. And you know uh, rather than for the economic activities, the most of the credit were used for the personal consumption. Um, and the people are not so magnanimous when it comes to requesting for credit for more than one one time by the needy because most of the most of the time the utilization of funds for the basic needs rather than on the economic development. And the programs has not been efficient as the members are unable to freely express their concerns if any higher official visits. And most of the member families have only two earning people and the rest are dependents. And most of the uh, members are illiterate. So these were the findings of the study, and I understood that you know uh, somewhere there is no like hundred percent utilization of the funds, um, you know, which were given through microfinance to the self-help groups. One reason is whether the funds are misused from the higher authorities itself, that is the people those who provide the loan, I mean, uh, finance to the women. And second is uh, the credits were not utilized for you know uh, bringing up the small businesses or something else like that. It was majority was used for consumption. So, uh, I think I would uh, conclude my presentation by this. Yeah, there we go. On just a second, uh, I feel your third objective could have been the other way. That is, your yes, objective is to study whether the credit provided was used only for consumption purpose or if it was used for economic development as well. Consumption yes, yes. is not the purpose of credit. So, yes, you sir. could uh, you, you could test whether it is used for the economic development or it is diverted for other purposes also. Okay. Yeah, it was diverted yeah, because like, the, from the study we understood yeah, that it was diverted yeah. for the more of the consumption. Yeah. Yes, yes, but your primary objective is to, uh, to understand whether it is used for the purpose for which it is granted or it is diverted. So, yeah, yes. Okay, uh, we are not uh, uh, going to discuss further because of positive time. I am uh, just uh, inviting the next presenters, Shilpa and uh, Dr. Sopna Gechari. Please start Thank your you, presentation. Sir. Sir, can I audibly? Say, say. Is my presentation visible to all? Not yet, not yet visible. A very good evening to everyone. I am Shilpa L, a research scholar in MS University. Now I am here to present a topic regarding public perception of digital transaction in Kerala with a special reference to Alapura district. We know that the COVID pandemic situation becomes severe nowadays. This situation has mandated many institutions to rethink the use of digital transaction in place of physical transaction of money. Uh, the government of India as well as RBI and the banks have asked the citizens to use the digital transaction to reduce the spread of virus. As a result, there has been a spur in digital transactions and the digital continue to rise in the coming days. Then I'm going to the introductory part. What what are the 
digital transaction. It is an automated or online operation that takes place between two people's business or organizations, etc. It is a capital transaction. Uh, please present the statement of problem, objectives, methodology, and findings only. Okay. Okay, sir. The second involves no pair, pair for completion of transaction. Purchasing goods from e commerce websites, buying tickets through smartphone app, or even signing up business contracts online fall under the umbrella of digital transaction. Such operations are quicker, convenient, accurate, and easier. Then, those two objectives of the study. The objective of the study is to determine the perception of the public towards the cash transactions in Kerala. Then, hypothesis. Now, hypothesis. There is no significant relationship between the income level of the respondents and their preference towards the cash transaction. Then, alternative hypothesis is uh, there is a significant relationship between the income level of the respondents and their preference towards the cash transaction. Uh, sir, can I go to findings? Yes, yes, proceed to the findings. Uh, educate the technology of cashless transaction to all the people with respect to their age so that they can easily understand the concept of cashless transaction, providing attractive offers and it discounts to those who make the cashless transaction. So it will encourage them to use it again. Next is since the prevention is better than your take adequate steps to avoid any security breach, both from the sides of the user and from the service provider. Next, the minimum amount of the digital transaction limit has to be removed so as to make the cash transaction equivalent one. Next is take the initiatives to give awareness about the terms and the conditions in which the cash transaction. Okay, Bank these are suggestions. Must... These are all suggestions. You just conclude your presentation. Conclusion. Okay, sir. The study has clearly highlighted the public perception towards the cashless transaction. It has primarily focused on both the positive and the negative uh, sides of producing the digital transaction. The positive signs are its a user system, transparency, security, budget, etc. Uh, now, it is how these factors encourage the digital transactions. The findings state that. While the people are becoming comfortable with the cashless payment, the negative perspectives are like security problems, poor network coverage, lack of merchant willingness, inadequate technical knowledge, default POS machine, delayed reimbursement in case of any transactions and financial needs. The government should take initiative steps to promote the cashless transaction for digital India. The study concludes that. India may become a cashless economy as the perception of the people will be rightly addressed by the government and the bank institution. They should pay the way for the safe and the secure means to digital transactions. Okay, Silpa, only one thing you have to uh, uh, be careful is uh, your objective is to study the perception of public towards digital transaction. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you put for the hypothesis. hypothesis to study the relationship between income level and uh, preference of digital transaction. Now, there is no uh, relationship with your object. And again, uh, there is no need to explain all the demographic factors, its percentage, interpretations, etc. in the paper. Huh? So, be careful and uh, uh, stick on to your objective only. Okay. okay Thank you. Ma'am, over to you, ma'am. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, Silpa, you made some uh, statements in your paper, in your full paper. Uh, that is, you are telling unavailability of swipe card facility in, that is POS machine uh, restricts the use of debit card and credit card. You may look into that. Uh, then again, telling uh, we need to visit a bank branch for taking DD. That situation is also getting changed, is changing now. 
on online request also banks started issuing dd like that anyway with the onset of new technologies like imps and upa the use of check and read is uh, relatively less that's also a fact anyway some of the statements you may uh, look into when when you publish the same matter for publication in the coming years okay take it positively thank you Next, next presentation. So the next uh, presentation uh, by Karthik K and uh, Joseph sir. Start your presentation. Yes, B sir. Am I audible? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Before starting, can the, the previous presenter can close the slide? Uh, before that takes place, uh, I request yeah. all the participants who are yet to present your paper to restrict it to five minutes. Please stick on with your obvious methodologies and findings so that all the others will also get a chance. Shilpa, please uh, stop presenting your screen. Shilpa. Host, host, uh, Snehit, you can stop racing. Okay, yes, okay. yes, sir. I have done that. So, Kartika, uh, you can. Uh, so, hope the is visible. Yes, yes, it's visible. Start, start your presentation and uh, try to, uh, Present within yeah, five sure, minutes. Sir. Sure, sir. Okay, respected Rasiya ma'am, Biju sir, other faculty members and research scholars. Uh, it's a privilege for me to present uh, this paper in this conference. I'm Kartika K. along with Dr. Anthony Joseph K. presenting the paper, Influence of Family Financial Discourse on Financial Literacy Among Women. So before moving to the objectives, I will just mention the literature background. Uh, as the woman's uh, life expectancy is more than men, there is a need for her to be financially independent at any point of time, especially after the death of her spouse or father. So it is needed for women to be pre-equipped with some financial skills to face the financial shocks. So there arises the need for financial literacy. While reviewing the literature, came to know that parental communication or the parental financial communication is a factor that leads to financial literacy of women. But seldom studies have been focused on the middle-aged women. Uh, more studies have been based on gender, that is men and women, as well as uh, among college students. So from the uh, literature itself, we came to know that there is a research gap uh, on the basis that to find long-term influence of family communication on financial literacy. So the objectives are to identify the awareness on financial motives and preference to invest in various avenues by women and to analyze the association of financial literacy of women with her family communication pattern. Then population was from Kerala, uh, who owns at least one flat or house in her name. The study has been restricted to Ernakulam and belongs to 35 to 55 years women. Global sampling has been done. 107 is the sample size. Primary data has been collected through questionnaire. Uh, while analyzing or measuring the financial literacy, we have only included the objective aspect. That means numerical ability has been assessed. Uh, while uh, measuring the communication pattern, we have on, uh, we have uh, adapted the questionnaire from the which is available in uh, family communication pattern theory as such, and we have included only the conversation area. That means how much intensely the family members are communicating uh, with the woman in the family. So uh, the results of the first objective, while analyzing the awareness on financial motives, we came to know that safety, interest rates, and tax benefits were, uh, were the financial motives of women rather than the risk factor. While analyzing the relation between, not the relation, but how much the fixed deposit, uh, 
how much they are interested to make investments in fixed deposit those women who believe that fixed deposit carry high rate of interest uh, we came to know that women are least confused that means they believe that fixed deposit carry high rate of interest when they are making the investment in such avenues whereas gold is concerned they are considering gold as a safe investment but seldom people are considering it as an investment avenue the reason might be they are considering it as a safer but but they are not considering it as an investment avenue so 58% contradiction is happening in this aspect then while we are talking about the concern of women on risk and return we came to know that they are giving more importance for return rather than risk but if an expert is giving an advice on financial matters they will be more concerned about the risk then while talking about the reasons considered before making investments they are giving importance for short term goals because they are giving focus on safety and regular income whereas they are least concerned about the capital appreciation that is long term goal while talking about the second objective that is relation between conversation in the family and financial literacy we came to know that financial literacy level is low whereas the conversation pattern is high and the research hypothesis was financial literacy of women is associated to pattern of conversation in her family but unfortunately we came to know that after we go and sign the rank test we came to know that there is no correlation there is no association between financial literacy and conversation pattern because the conversation pattern is very high whereas the financial literacy is low and finally uh, we should uh, we have to infer that even if the family members are encouraging women to discuss any topic in terms of financial or political matters they are not considered to be financially literate and finally i would like to say that in the case of studies among students or young adults we came to know that there is some connection between financial literacy and family financial communication but as far as middle aged women are considered i think they need to update their self uh, with financial aspects in, in in spite of their family clutches these are the references and finally this paper is a call for women to rise up what it really takes for the reward of financial freedom thank you ah uh, yes what's the demographic Ma profile of your sample the demographic profile uh, map the age group was between uh, 35 and 55 and uh, the woman who owns at least one house or flat in her home in her name can still you believe that uh, finance uh, should come in the family discourse to educate her about the financial financial aspects It's highly it related it? to the yeah. anyway thank you Karthik, only one thing: uh, your title has influenced the family financial disclosure on uh, uh, financial literacy among women. Huh? Yes, uh, sir. And uh, uh, the objectives, the order of yeah. the objectives. The second yeah, yeah. objective should be your first objective because that is your primary objective as per your title. Huh? Yes, and uh, you used uh, and established the standardized tool also. so i think that uh, only one that objective is enough to uh, elaborate your paper okay anyway yeah, yes, good sir. Attempt. yes sir good thank attempt. you sir ma'am shall we proceed to the next paper yeah last paper yes. dr bjv uh, our yeah, session is started at 340 only now it is 522 so yeah, previous uh, tracks yeah last paper and one more paper actually the last session yeah that's it paper. yeah that's it that's paper. a very good paper it's a very yeah. good paper we should please please so ranish please start presenting yes sir So one second, sir. Do you want to proceed? Yes, yes. 
Okay. Uh, good evening, uh, sir, madam, and uh, everyone. My topic, the influence of financial risk tolerance uh, in the financial literacy and the value of financial advice. So myself, Rani, I'm a research scholar at the Rajagiri College of Social Sciences under the guidance of Dr. Rakesh uh, Krishnan, Assistant Professor, School of Management Studies, Cochin University, Kusok. Uh, FL, financial literacy, just a brief, it is a knowledge and ability to use the knowledge. FRT is the maximum amount of uncertainty that someone is uh, willing to accept. Sir, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Try to finish and your presentation with a time, okay? Yes. yes, yes, sir, yes, sir. Value of financial advice, it is the willingness to pay for financial advice. And according to modern portfolio theory, it major contribution is the asset allocation that considers maximum return with lower risk. Then the hypothesis, so the, the major focus, how does the financial risk tolerance influences the financial literacy and willingness to pay for financial advice. And um, the hypothesis, like uh, highly literate investors, they value financial advice. So we have come to the uh, three hypotheses, financial literacy, does financial literacy positively influences, uh, positively influences willingness to pay and financial risk tolerance has a positive impact on willingness to pay for uh, willingness to pay for financial advice and hypothesis three FRT has a moderating effect in the relationship between financial literacy and WTP and the data collection sample size is 508 and FL uh, the questionnaire from the OECD international network and we consider the financial literate uh, financial knowledge the financial advice financial behavior financial risk tolerance Wall and Krishla 2020-20, wherein we mainly consider the risk attitude and the risk capacity. <coughs> Data collection, uh, um, two-phase interviews and um, a telephonic interview, and we have done a questionnaire with target groups, uh, especially the uh, individuals. Um, then the methodology part, we have adopted a single bounded, single value, uh, contingent valuation method where we ask the method, uh, we ask the individuals whether they are ready to pay for financial advice. And we have used logistic regression power method to find out the model of fitness. And the findings is financial literacy is positively related. Uh, and we have used model one of Hayes process. Uh, then uh, findings. Financial literacy is positively correlated with the WTP and positive, there exists a po the positive coefficients of financial literacy and financial uh, risk tolerance indicate that uh, willingness to pay increases when these coefficients increases. At the same time, uh, you know, we can say people are ready to pay for commission if the word advice, if the financial advice is valuable to them. And financial risk tolerance as an individual variable for uh, testing willingness to pay could establish a relationship between the two and hence hypothesis two that is hypothesis two means the financial risk tolerance on willingness to pay is accepted though there exists a positive relation between frtp and the wtp the p-value interaction shows little significance and more into the studies we see the 62 percent they are ready to uh, pay for the advice but they do not uh, get the advice that fits their income or maybe too many investors make them uh, baffled or confused and more than 70 percentage, they have financial knowledge and they are still ready to uh, pay for the financial advice. Thank you, sir. It concludes. Okay, okay, sir. Come yes, Rani. Uh, yes, madam. Your, that your first sentence is that target population consists of people from 25 to 65 years of age. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, whether the financial literacy, financial risk tolerance, and the willingness to pay uh, will remain the same yes, across sir. all age groups. It, uh, it changes in different age patterns. Mm -hmm. um, okay. um, as, the, as the age increases, uh, the risk tolerance, they are ready to, because they have got more income, they are ready to make, uh, um, make investment, they are ready to go for financial advice. They are willing to pay for the financial advice. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry.
So you used a simple random sampling method uh, for selection of sample. Uh, in what way yes, you expected this, uh, or uh, in what way you selected the sample? Sir, uh, initially, uh, 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 yes, sir. Initially, I have uh, approached uh, the uh, contacts uh, wherein I can approach them. Like uh, I know these people are uh, they have within this particular income bracket. Uh, they are this particular which group they they are uh, educated. Fifty nine percent. Of all these, uh, these samples, they have, got have the exact uh, frame. We have approached. Do you have the exact sample frame with you? The yes, total sir. list of population. Yeah. Uh, total list of population. No, sir. Uh, without I'm having the total list of population with you, how uh, you use this a simple random sampling method for selection of sample? Okay, uh, I've got, yeah, I understand. Okay, okay, okay. I, I think if maybe the snowball sampling is the best answer I could give. <laughs> yeah, you uh, you adopted actually snowball design, but uh, you explained it as simple random sampling method. That's okay, why I asked. Okay, okay, okay. okay. sir, ma'am, okay. we have a last presentation. This is the last, last and final presentation. One more, oh, sir. One, one no, more, or we have one more, one more presentation. <laughs> I think there's strong request uh, by a man uh, from the morning. Actually, we haven't listed in the track, but he wanted to present, and uh, okay. it's a very nice paper. I think. So. Okay, if okay. we agree, let us let us take. Yeah. Sneha, yes, please. Name is Mr. De Deep Prasad Sadabadi, Centurion University of Technology and Management, Odisha, to present on the. Title: The Effect of Cross-Border Merger and Acquisition Performance on Shareholders' Wealth, Evidence from India. So please. And a more audible please. Please, please, please. Uh, esteemed persons, and thank you, Vijay sir, for giving an opportunity to uh, present my paper. Actually, this paper uh, has a large, but it's an empirical paper. So I study the impact of cross-border mergers and acquisition performance on shareholders. I am not discuss much about time and measures. I really try to study. I try to study actually uh, the effect of uh, shareholders on the acquiring company. So the company are going for cross-border merger. What is the effect of that Indian company on shareholders? Most of the Indian, company, Indian study has accounting based measure, but I am using market based measure advocated by our events uh, in methodology. In a past vehicle, I have used methodology. So, a lot of research uh, metrics I have done, and uh, approach and median result is concluded. So some are telling there are positive results, some are telling there are negative results. So, that motivates me to take the study whether Indian company generates positive or down. Having said this, then I take the samples to the database. So, by uh, taking the share price, I have found the four domestic markets and 58 cross border, uh, cross -border markets. Then what I did, I collected the price and then I collected the sensitive price as the market broker. So I collected the 58 their price of this cross border, then 40 domestic share price of this company, then I take the sensex as the 50 for the share price. Then I calculate the abnormal data, simple expected return minus actual return. The actual return is challenged here. The actual return I have calculated by using the market model. Then I consider cumulative abnormal data. Then why is the Then I call it cumulative abnormal data. Then I test the whether the returns are significant or not. Uh, if I look at this, I have used various combinations. You can see there are 40 test combinations, then 20 test, then 10 test, 2 test, and the event day itself, the zero, then some pre-event period, post-event period, then the event 
negative window. So I find globally, if you look at my P values, you see on the extreme one day event period, that means the day of announcement of the and application, we generate the negative return. And if you look at the overall window, 20, 20, and 10, 10, the sample is generating a negative return. That means how we are the information is replaced prior to the announcement of the entry as a hint to the policy making to care about it. So this is one of the hints from the market. So if you look at my graph, you see the event date itself is zero. Before event date, there is a positive return. And after the event date, the server is hitting the graph. That means there is absolute data information that is happening in the Indian market. And that shows that there is a complete integration of the Indian market to the capital market. If we look at the comparison between domestic, then I take the domestic mergers and acquisition, then I take the cross border mergers and acquisition, then I take the difference of mean difference. What is happening really is which, uh, whether domestic is generating more or cross border is generating. I do not find any significant effect by comparing neither domestic or cross border mergers and acquisition, creating value for the shareholder. If you look at the statistics and look at the graph, I put the cumulative average internal average return in the graph for make it simple in the event at zero, 20 days before and 20 days after. Absolutely no, no, no significant result. And both are uh, showing any value, not creating any significant value to the server. In the post announcement, there is a erosion of value and pre announcement, there is some positive return to the server, but that can't be done. Coming back to that, then I have to go on for the oil company. Those some advisors of this work on this, then I have those companies have taken advising services and those companies are not taking advisors. Then I have to compare. And I find there is no significant effect on advisors. If we look at the graph also, there is no return generated by the graph. Then I will try to see what the option is for this. Then I take the, the method of price, price based on market capitalization, price to book value. Then I try to find the convenient that will look well. I find the number in that method of price. It's a dummy variable one. It is a significant growth and tries to do the something that is a higher growth with the significant value. So, conclusion overall. So, key finding shareholder is not creating value for market announcement, second, including advisor services on the most significant issues to domestic cross product. A determinant I find method of payment price to book value are the two key determinants for good That's all. Uh, uh, a format uh, very limited to answer for myself, but uh, I've tried hard to see that paper. Thank you for oh. giving me your Teacher, please. Uh, okay, you may ask. Dr. Biju, Biju okay. uh, Devi Prasad, sir, uh, you made a nice presentation and uh, uh, it's a nice paper because you use the event study methodology to elaborate uh, the effect of cross border mergers and acquisitions on performance of shareholders' wealth. Huh? Yes, sir. but uh, yes. uh, in, in this paper itself, uh, you have uh, analyzed the effect of domestic merger as well as a cross border oh, merger. Well, yes. And uh, uh, you find that there is no significant difference because yes. mergers and acquisitions in total uh, gives the same results itself, isn't it? Yes, yes. that's okay. Uh, and uh, another dimension also you analyzed. I think uh, uh, you can... Yes, sir. It. Inclusion of advisor service. I take those companies have taken the advising service as dummy. Those are not taking advisor service. So I try to find what is the difference. I find no difference in this. Okay, okay. Okay, it's a, it's a nice work. Uh, For that, that, sir, I also try to find out the regions. What is the region? Then I also find there are two regions. Method of payment, another is price to book value. Of that two factors are really influencing the sector. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. that's all. Okay.
Now all the 11 presentations are over. Uh, I, I think uh, we should appreciate the organizing secretary for that. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> the management of the time. Actually, 31 papers are presented in a single day. Hmm? Uh, each candidate has got a reasonable time. Hmm? In the last session, some of the uh, presenters didn't get time. Uh, that happens in every every conference. The participants should uh, learn to present their paper with, within three minutes, two minutes, even one minute. That that can also happen. So it's an experience. Anyway, uh, my appreciations and sincere thanks to the organizing secretary, conference secretary, and the entire team. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving this opportunity. Thank you. Congratulations, Biju sir, and uh, the entire team behind this uh, uh, wonderful effort. Uh, from morning nine till uh, this uh, 545, uh, 540. Okay, once again, congratulations from my side also. Thank you, thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Rasia Bigam, ma'am, and Dr. Biju sir for the comments. And uh, actually, we have uh, taken a Herculean task. We have uh, undergoing a task uh, for smooth conduction of this program. I think we have reached something like uh, a good way of uh, doing this process, uh, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Asya Bigam, ma'am, and Dr. Pitisa uh, for uh, chairing this session and gave the participants uh, wonderful comments. Thanks a lot. Uh, over to Bhagavadi. Uh, yes, sir, we are here. It's all problem. Yes, sir. We are now going for an official vote of thanks to our chair, chairs today. Over to Bhagya. We had a total of 11 papers in this session, and each of these papers were different and give us an overview on different aspects of finance. Our chairs for the session were Dr. Rasia Begum, the Dean and Professor, Department of Commerce, University of Kerala, and Dr. Vijuti, Associate Professor, Department of Commerce, University of Kerala. It's been a great source of inspiration and guidance we had you both with us thank you teachers for taking that strain in looking through each and every paper providing valuable suggestions to the paper presenters let the inputs provided by our teachers serve as a guidelines for the future paper presenters and for publishing of papers thank you so we come uh, to the conclusion session of the conference and uh, uh, from morning onwards, we have uh, three sessions, track A, track B, and track C. Track A chaired by Professor Simon Turtle and uh, uh, Professor Hamel Pandya. And track B was chaired by Professor Kimari Takar and Professor Harikumar. And track C was chaired by Professor Takya Bigam and Dr. Bijuti. And uh, we, we, we have got around 100 uh, papers and we have selected 60 papers. And out of the 60 papers, we have uh, created a track of 30 purpose as presented uh, in the conference, and uh, uh, we have got reviews of these 30 purpose. And uh, uh, then after that, we will uh, go to publish this number of tracks. And uh, this is the end of the uh, session tomorrow. Uh, Meet up uh, uh, at 6 p.m. Uh, continue the workshop. The conversation will be handled by Abhus Kumar Mandal, IIT Chennai. Thank you all, Chayas, uh, uh, for the Thank you, participants. Uh, thank you, my scholars. Thank you, my scholars who are working with this process. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all. Yeah, on behalf of the entire delegates and the whole department, we congratulate Dr. Biju Avi, the organizing secretary. Thank you. Congratulations to all the uh, research scholars and uh, uh, the students also behind uh, Dr. Biju, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Means the team, the entire team. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, teachers and delegates. By this, we come to the end of today's conference. So tomorrow, we'll be continuing with our workshop. Uh, be right there at 6 p.m. Thank you.